You're listening to The Virtue Podcast, brought to you by the Great Hearts Institute. Good conversations around the great conversation. Welcome back. Welcome back to The Virtue Podcast. I am so pleased to be introducing you today to actor, director, uh, connoisseur of all things Shakespeare, Nick Hutchison uh, of the Globe Theatre. Nick, so good to have you with us today. Thank you. It's great to be back. It's lovely to see you. Yeah, we had you out here in March in Phoenix, which wasn't probably half bad for a Londoner like yourself. I suspect you enjoyed the weather a little bit, some sunshine and so forth. It was um, extraordinary in March. Well, it was and, 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 and the warmth was felt both uh, climactically, but also in the, uh, the gathering right there at the Phoenix Convention Center, the National Symposium. You were a big part of that uh, and center stage on a couple of occasions. Uh, you also then reflected on your time with us in uh, the forthcoming issue of Virtue, where we're focused on the fine arts. We're just recapping some of what we had. Do you mind telling folks a little bit of what you experienced? Because this is your first national symposium of classical education, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it was an extraordinary experience because I had no idea what I was getting into, really. I'm, I'm not sort of a, a, a symposium buff. And, and I sort of flew out to Phoenix and was amazed by where I was and the size of the place. And I was really, really impressed. As I said in the article I, I wrote for Virtue, I wasn't sure whether what I was going to get was a sort of very generalized, isn't art wonderful, um, sort of Shakespeare fest and an art fest. And actually what, what I came into and really, really respected was the, the thought and the precision and the detail behind everyone's work. It was so exciting. You know, the, the, the first keynote speech was about science and art. And I love that because I, I'm a, 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 a detailed man about, about Shakespeare and how Shakespeare works. And it was just so exciting to be with people who felt the same about art, that it's not some sort of generalized feel good thing, but that it's actually about a tradition and about a craft that, that that matters and that affects how you view this stuff, be it the Ukrainian folk song we all ended up singing in the second keynote speech, or, or details about inclusivity and diversity. It was so precise and so mm. thought through. I, I, had a, I had a wonderful two days, three days, whatever it was. I can't do three days of, of, of in total of just meeting and, and talking to really exciting people. Well, I appreciate that because you were one of the exciting personalities there uh, in large measure because you brought that depth around the Shakespearean uh, corpus, the work of, of the Bard, uh, but you were in conversation, uh, main stage in conversation as we did a little exposition right there live in front of the audience around Romeo and Juliet, right, in the way it had been staged in an operatic form. Uh, some of this interdisciplinary really felt to me uh, like a bit of, of, uh, of what is needed as we try to revitalize education and specifically K-12 education, namely to show the arts, as you're just pointing out, as integral, as, as very much a part of the human experience. And they're not, they're not just for those those types, you know, those thespian yeah. types. Yeah. Was there anything in at the event that really helped to bring that home for you? Again, you mentioned Fred Turner's talk to open up and explain the relationship between science and, and art, but specifically as you address teachers and the teachers of drama, uh, anything that sort of came out to help help make clear to you really the importance of a, a more integrated approach to education? I think it, what was interesting was that a number of different approaches i mean i'm i'm a huge believer in, in in art being about you know i i spend a lot of my time in a rehearsal room counting you know syllables you know and i i i spend a lot of my time thinking about numbers and and, and the numerics of shakespeare not just about what it all means but about how he writes it mm -hmm. and there were so many like-minded people and the, the teachers and, and uh, who I work with on, on the workshops and indeed who uh, the talk I gave were so keen to, to make it specific and and they weren't all um they weren't all 
drama teachers, they weren't all English teachers, but they were all trying to work out the best way of making clear to young people that this isn't some sort of wishy-washy wash of, of, of a sort of sentimentality, but that actually mm -hmm. it, there are ways of looking at this that make it work. Mm -hmm. And there's a tradition that, as I said in my article, you know, the line is unbroken that, that, that goes back to the way Shakespeare wrote, mm -hmm. to the way you can see it now. And, and that culture is is really energizing when you understand it i think and and, and it sounds like it's going to be off-putting but it's really not and the joy for me was working with teachers in, in a rehearsal room and a, a workshop room who, who got that yeah well they do uh they did and they do and i think you really were uh providing edification and encouragement and support your time at the the royal academy of dramatic art at the globe i mean you you, you have a a real breadth of expertise that you that you bring to the stage and to the lectern, and I'm really interested if you could to reflect for a few moments on how what you've seen over the past three or so decades as an actor, as a director, but also as a teacher. What are some trends that we need to be aware of uh, in terms of where the field has been, where it's going, uh, and 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 to take that account of that in order to really to, to be, uh, you know, to, to, to be the best promoters of, of, of Shakespeare and the, and the craft as we possibly can be. What are some of the trends that you're seeing? I'm, I'm first up touched that you think it's three decades. Um, it, it, I think positive. The biggest change in, in, in my time doing Shakespeare has been because of the globe and the way the globe has forced us to think about a visible audience, an audience that are part of the show. Mm. Um, you don't see anyone anymore on stage in this country, and I don't think in the States, coming on stage doing unspoken thoughts spoken aloud mm -hmm. as a monologue. You are mm -hmm. talking to an audience, the audience are visible, they're part of the play, and Shakespeare wrote these plays to be performed to an audience that are, that are a, a cast member. Mm -hmm. And that, that has totally changed in the 20 years the globe's been up and running. And I don't, my, my belief is you don't understand Shakespeare, you don't get Shakespeare until you understand that's how he writes. Um, <clears throat> so that that's a positive. The negative, if you like, would be, from my point of view, and this is controversial, you know, whenever two or three Shakespeare directors are, are gathered in his name, there is always going to be a, a punch up about what you do at the end of a line of verse. <laughs> but the, the, the sadness for me is this. It's not prevalent, but it's it's getting their idea that you just ignore the structure that, you know, this is a man who wrote 38 plays, mm -hmm. most of which was in verse. So let's forget about that and let's just try and pretend it's prose because um, that makes it modern and understandable. And mm -hmm, I don't think mm -hmm. it does. Um, and that's something that Peter Hall, who was my hero, the, the first um, director of the Royal Shakespeare Company and a genius, um, was fighting against 20 years ago, the, the, the decline of rigour about verse and how verse works. And, and I think we're sort of fighting back. So mm. I think that there's a... The Globe is fantastic. Giles Block at The Globe is an amazing text director. He's, he's head of text at The Globe. And it sounds so arid, doesn't it? But it's really important. This man wrote 38 plays in verse. Mm -hmm. It's easier to write prose. Mm -hmm. So he's got to care about verse. Mm -hmm. And, and I, mm -hmm. I'm just, I, I suppose there are a few of us fighting, well, quite a few of us fighting back against if you just say it, it'll sound more modern and people understand it because that's not true. Do you do you have a sense for is is that really just the sort of contemporaneous line that it has to be more relevant? I mean, obviously, we take the Bard's work and we've set it in different contexts, right? Outside of its you know its historical or even its contextual original delivery, is that about trying to be con? relevant in some way what what's the what's the aversion to verse as far as you can tell i don't think it's about relevance i think it's trying to make it understandable you know every, everyone's terrified that you know it's difficult the verse the language isn't the same as we talk like like they all spoke that language you know yeah, the yeah right did not speak and you know de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum right, right, right. 
I, th I think it's about trying to make it intelligible and actually it does it's counterproductive it's mm. counterintuitive that it is but if you actually acknowledge the verse and, and 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 as peter hall says and fred brilliantly did in his keynote speech last year in phoenix about how much you can take in on memory it's about 10 syllables mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you take in 10 syllable chunks you're following it you take in 60 syllable chunks and halfway through you're going it's all very lovely, but I've no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> you know, and, and I, you know, Shakespeare knew this. These are not just Shakespeare. All these guys knew this. Yeah. And hearing Fred talk about it in neurological terms and memory terms was so brilliant. I was, that was my first contact with, with you know, the whole Great Hearts and the, the whole symposium. And I was, I can't tell you how exciting it was mm. to hear someone approach it from a different way, and I, I was doing the math it, quietly in, in, in my notebook while he was talking, and it's like, I think if you're good at Shakespeare, it's 20 lines of verse a minute. Mm -hmm. So it entirely tied in with the numerical memory stuff that he was talking about. It was just great. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, again, to 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 restate that this notion that this 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 work that we're doing in promoting great works, great artifacts of civilization, and certainly great words, that have been passed down to us is somehow more than a than a sort of archaeological exposition but it, that it that it still vitalizes that it's still got punch that it's that there's power in those words and that there's something about the verse that you that shakespeare has employed that still works deep down on us i mean i remember fred speaking of the again the neurological and the biological almost the heartbeat right of uh of those lines and and i thought to myself really is there a science behind this or at least a science that demonstrates that as you said shakespeare had this shakespeare and his contemporaries they knew this right they knew this intuitively um is there you know as you as you thought as you witnessed it there in phoenix uh with the teachers specifically as you work with teachers you were providing some real technical instruction on how to read and perform shakespeare what were some of the things, if you don't mind recapping, some absolute essentials, right, that that you tried to convey to those teachers to effectively deliver Shakespeare to the next generation? It, it as far as I'm concerned, it's the really unfashionable stuff of, am I speaking prose, not verse? Am I speaking verse, not prose? Why do I choose this moment to change from one to the other? There's a still a school of thought that, you know, the upper classes speak verse and the lower classes speak prose. Hmm. And like all generalizations, there's something behind it, but it's not true. You know, Beatrice, the first half of the play in Much Ado, speaks mostly prose. Rosalind's love scenes are in prose, and she's posh as you can get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's specifics like that. It's if I'm speaking verse, where do my sentences end? Middle of a line, end of a line, why? Why do I have this number of syllables in a line, not that number? And there are so many generalizations made about these things and it's i suppose what it comes down to is I, I believe in close reading i believe that you need to investigate everything with shakespeare and mm -hmm. go okay why this why that and and i always say this to students and actors in professional productions i'm, I'm directing i don't really care what the answer to the question is because the answer to the question is going to depend on your production, my production, who's playing it, blah, blah, blah. You know, as you said, we set them in different contexts. We set them in different periods. Those are going to change. What does matter to me is that you know the questions to ask. And, and I was, you know, the teachers really got on, really got this, that, that all you have to do to explain to students is they ask the questions. Why am I doing that? Mm -hmm. well, you know, Hamlet, the most famous line in Shakespeare, to be or not to be, that is the question. Well, it's 11 syllables. And the iambic pentameter is 10. So why? Well, mm -hmm. you know, your answer to that might be different to my answer to that. But my answer to that is Hamlet's got to be a revenge hero. He's a university intellectual. He's got to be a revenge hero. If you're a revenge hero, you go on a quest. So Hamlet, if he was a revenge hero, would say to be or not to be, that is the quest, which would be a perfect 10 syllable line. But he can't. He has to say to be or not to be, that is the quest. Yeah. <laughs> And if you can't say the word quest without turning it into a question and you're playing a character who has over 50% more questions than any other character in Shakespeare in a play that opens with a question, mm -hmm. it seems to me Shakespeare's sort of telling you something. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm old fashioned like this, and, and, and the teachers love this. I sort of think Shakespeare's really good at writing Shakespeare. <laughs> and I think Shakespeare's, and it annoys me to say it, but I think he's better than I am at writing Shakespeare. <laughs> so I'm going with him, you know, and I, and I think you, you know, he tells you how to do it, and you can choose not to, mm -hmm. but I think you're a bra brave person if you decide that, yeah, no, I think I can do better than that. Well, no, I appreciate what you're saying because. Clearly, in classical circles, we have an almost instinctive uh, knee-jerk deference, right, to great works, uh, and 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 so I think that you probably found yourself among friends uh, as you joined us at the symposium. Now, there's also something that you touched on in the article, the forthcoming article, uh, where craft can be lost, as you put it, in a sea of bardolatry. So, perhaps in the classical world, unlike for you know other prosifying uh, readings of Shakespeare, we might err on being bardolatrous, right? What are some things we have to, to watch for there? That is to say, how do we avoid uh, bardolatry and really recover what you're describing, which, which is vital? There's something in the bard, you're saying he's really great. How do we maintain or really get to the heart of that greatness and not become just mere deferential uh, bardolaters? Well, I think, I think there's a what I mean by bardolatry is, is is the sort of assumption that everything's perfect that yeah. you know that he came into the world fully formed. I mean the plays get better. I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know I, I don't think the language of you know it, it's really interesting. You do comedy of errors and you do the Winter's Tale and you're a different world. Mm -hmm. You know he gets better as I think Burbage and the actors get better. Mm. And, and and what I I suppose what I mean by bardolatry, what I can't bear is this idea of just sort of everything he does is perfect you know there are mistakes there are i think quite a lot of deliberate mistakes i think he messes around he plays mm. around you know Catherine duncan jones who sadly has literally just died um a wonderful wonderful writer who, who wrote a brilliant book called ungentle shakespeare about the fact that this guy is not a saint Mm -hmm. You know, and people want him to be, I mean, either they want him to be Earl of Oxford, but that's another story, um, or they want him to be this sort of saintly figure, and he's not. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, me, I don't want to go out for a drink with a saint. Mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. go out for, a, you know, I want to go out with the guy who plays jokes in Twelfth Night on Burbage, mm -hmm. so he doesn't know he's limping until he's told he's limping on stage. You know, I, I love the practicality of it. I love the humanity behind it rather than putting him on some sort of pedestal and, 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 and sort of, I say this in text class often, you know, it, it, there are people who treat these scripts like they're handed down in tablets of stone from Mount yeah, Sinai. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and, and they're not, you know, it, it's what's a text. He revises, he changes, he has new thoughts. He's not above flattering the new King, uh -huh. you know, He's a he's a bloke. He's not this sort of saintly, otherworldly figure writing thirty eight so, plays for the greater glory of humanity. No, no, no. That's really good because how how then do we teach it? And I think I've heard you say this, but if we're going to teach those texts in a way that will get to the bloke, so that so that these young people, right, so that they can begin to see, well, this guy's got some stuff, and he's a bit of a jokester. He's a bit of a ham. But he's a genius in some respects because he's doing things that I can't even imagine attempting. How, how do you, how does the text or your analysis and the way you teach, though you would other, encourage others to teach, really get at that? Because I think we miss that a lot of times for the very reasons that we've named. I think it's a really important point. I was I was doing a lecture last year for six hundred um, A level students who are sort of sixteen, seventeen year olds, so end of high school. And there were questions at the end and, and a kid stood up and I think he'd been prompted by his friends and said, you know, why are we still doing Shakespeare? Because there are other writers are available. And you could see his teachers just going through cardiac arrest at the rudeness. <laughs> and I said, no, I think it's a really good question. Yep. Why are we still doing this stuff? Yep. And and the answer to why we're doing and, and I feel this very strongly. I feel if it's just a sort of historical exercise in language, we shouldn't do them. You know, we can put them in a museum and go visit, mm -hmm. but there's no need to perform them. But the point is that he has a way of articulating human emotion and human experience in a way that 
almost no other writer has, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I, I give you an example. I think I hope we have time. I, I was doing, there's an American drama school in London called BADA, the British American Drama Academy. And rather a lot of years ago, and it'll become clear how many, I was doing a production of Pericles, mm. and which I, is a play I adore, but it's not well known. And the students were struggling and they were struggling. And, they, you know, not with the language or anything, but just why we're doing this play, and which is a sort of late romance. And, and you know, and it was in about week three of rehearsals that 9-11 happened. Mm. And we took it. You know, I'm working with American students who are far from home, and it was genuinely shocking. And we took that bit of time off, and then we came back, and they suddenly got it that Pericles is a play in which we know the dead don't come back to life in this world, but for three hours, let's pretend they do, that you bury your wife at sea who's died in childbirth, that you mourn at your child's grave, and that they're restored to you. Wow. What would yes. that be? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's a punch to the gut, and there aren't many writers who can do that. And, and and when that stops mattering, and when that stops being important, we'll stop doing it. Yep. But until yep. then, it just seems to me that, you know, you, you have an option to, to explain to students how much this stuff matters. I mean, you can get the reverse. You can get the worst teachers in the world who I remember going to a, when I was at the National Theatre as an actor. You know, we did a workshop on Romeo and Juliet and, and the school teacher was explaining that their, their marriage was entirely platonic. And we're like, yeah, this is really kicking with the 15 year olds. You know, they're married. They're allowed to. But no, 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 no. There's no physical attraction between them. It, 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 it's, it's an emotional thing. And you just want to go. And there they go. Off and never to watch Shakespeare again. You know, and, and it is. He's down and dirty and he's. I love all that. Yep. And that's what I mean about the practicality and not the bardolatry. Yep. No, that's good. That's really helpful. That's really helpful. Well, you well know, since you signed up to come back in uh, 23, that we're going to be focusing on the tradition today. That's our, our theme uh, for, for February of next year. Maybe you'd describe for us just a handful of the traditions that we you've, you've alluded to, right? At the Globe, and as the Globe has continued its good work, what are some of the traditions and practices that any would-be Shakespeare drama teacher should remember as they read and reproduce the Bard? I think, I think the first one, the, the most important one, really, which I have talked about, is this idea that he's writing, as they all are, you know, that they're using the verse form to say something. Mm -hmm. and, and Peter Hall said, gosh, it's got to be 20 years ago, there are only about 10 actors left alive who know how to carry on that tradition. And I think that's not true anymore because I think there are more and more of us mm -hmm. who are fighting to preserve it. Um, I, I don't know if you know this, this is a glorious tradition that Garrick's sword is handed down from the next Shakespearean act to the next Shakespearean. And um, Branagh has it at the moment and I think he's handing it on. I'm not even sure it hasn't gone to Tom Hiddleston. Um, and, and I love that tradition. I love mm -hmm. that idea that we are performing something that goes back through the centuries that matters. And if you get how he writes and why he writes the way he writes, I, I, I'm not suggesting for a moment you have to perform like the Globe. You know, I love a set. I love lighting. Um, technical rehearsals are enormously enjoyable. I, you know, I, give me a revolver and I'm a happy man. But that's not how they worked. And you need to understand the tradition of how they work to extend, if you like, to modify the tradition. And, and it goes back to really simple questions like, you know, how many syllables? Why this word, not that word? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a difference between stand and unfold yourself and stand and reveal yourself. As I always say in the beginning of Hamlet, and reveal yourself scans. It works. It just means say who you are. But unfold means I'm folded and I'm scared and I'm cold and it's a different word. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And it's it's the tradition of language. And I, I do a lot of work on on wit through throughout the English drama, um, going from Shakespeare right through to sort of Stoppard and Pinter, and modern writers like you know, mm. uh, and, and and really modern writers and and. It's a tradition of using language precisely. 
Mm-hmm. I suppose that's what I, I, I love. I love precision. Um, there's a fantastic writer called Nick Deer who wrote a play which I love called a short play called Lunch in Venice. And I use it as a counterpoint to Shakespeare because he's using language with the same precision. Mm-hmm. And, and that's following in a tradition that goes back to, well, back to Shakespeare and, and beyond. I mean, if you want to go all the way, it takes you way back to the Greeks. Yep. And, and, and all the classical work that you guys were talking about, you know, and I'm, I'm not an expert on Greek drama but i but i love it and i'm fascinated by it but you know there was so much at, at, in phoenix last year of discussion about poesis and, and and creation and how it works and you just think we're in a tradition that goes back thousands of years mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with this it's not just 400 since shakespeare yep. and that seems to me something that it, it's foolish to throw away yeah well we certainly hope uh to be a source of revitalization, encouragement, uh, you know, maintaining the, the the vitality of the tradition, to be sure. Uh, I, but what I what I hear you saying in particular is that the way we attend to those those texts, right, those scripts, and the way we care for each word and the precision of the frame and the and the line and the versification, that that all matters. And it's packed in there, right? There's there's layer upon layer. I I, I think that precision, but also the sense in which each word conveys just a host of meanings that are all interlaced or webbed within the larger drama uh, is what makes uh, what makes this work so very, very, very much the, the work of a genius. I, I'm, I'm really I'm, I'm pleased, of course, that you that you came to, 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 to Phoenix almost sight unseen. Right. We had a, a common interlocutor, our, our common friend, Scott Newstock. Uh, whose whose book had just come out, I think, earlier that year, How to Think Like Shakespeare. Uh, And he had contacted me to let me know that you were at Rhodes College, where he works. And I think you were working on maybe a Marlowe seminar or something. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you've done a little work stateside before you joined us in Phoenix. How, how, uh, as you were naming some of those, uh, those sort of recipients of the tradition, those who are carrying it on, what do you see going on stateside that's really worth uh, identifying or highlighting for those uh, of our viewers and listeners who might be interested? Where's Shakespeare really getting a, a second wind, if you will, uh, in the States? Well, I've, I've, I've been very fortunate in that I've worked an awful lot in the U.S., not just at Rose. I, I, I started working um, for what was then Shenandoah Shakespeare that's now the American Shakespeare Center in mm-hmm. Virginia. Um, and I've directed the Folger, um, and so I've and and at the McCoy in in, in Memphis. So I, I've directed a lot in the states and worked with infinite numbers of American students at the Globe. I, I worked with you know Syracuse and Notre Dame and and um, Guthrie and and L- Rutgers, loads of students at the Globe. So I'm I'm very used to working with Americans. I think there's an incredibly strong passion for Shakespeare in your country I think it's really and I I think I'm allowed to say this I'm allowed to say this I prefer working with American actors on it um I I love working with American British actors and I love British actors and I used to be one but we all come with something you know some baggage to it American Mm -hmm. actors seem to me to just want to do it Mm -hmm. and are just determined to and you, you you talk to them as I talk to your teachers about the precision and about the tradition and everything, and they just thrive on it. Mm-hmm. And you look at the work they do at the American Shakespeare Center in, in Stanton, Virginia, and it's extraordinary um, what, what the way the detail and the desire for precision they have. Um, the Folger, of course, greatest Shakespeare library in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I was directing much ado about nothing there once, and you know, in the morning you spend the day looking at the folio and a quarto and the real thing, mm-hmm. and you rehearse the thing in the afternoon. And it's just mm-hmm. like, if that's not a tradition going back, you know, here I am yep. with a script produced in the time, and now I'm working with modern actors on it. I think I think in, uh, the the US has a really good approach to Shakespeare. I think there's a really good mix of wanting to shake it up and wanting to know how it worked and that wanting to be precise. And I, 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 you know, note to artistic directors out there, I am available. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love working in the US because um, I, I love working with American actors. I yeah. find it very invigorating and enlightening for me. 
Yeah. You know, and, and, I, and I, part of, you know, I'm old enough now. Thank you for the three decades. Um, I'm old enough now that I need it to challenge me to make it fun for me. Do you know what I mean? And, yep, and yep. You, you work with people and you're going, oh my God, I never thought of that. Yep. And no one ever believes you. They all think, oh, he's so old. He must know, you know, all that. And you're going, no, I hadn't thought that. No, that's brilliant. Yeah. And, I, and I, you know, some of the people I met at Phoenix last year, um, Stefan Levinsky, people like that, you're working with people going, oh, oh no, I hadn't thought of coming at that angle. That's really interesting. And, you know, we all, I mean, enjoy, not just enjoy, but we learn from each other and you adjust your craft mm -hmm. to take other people's in. And that, I mean, that's one of the joys of a symposium like last year's. Yep. This, um, is, is, you know, you're, you, you're sitting in a bar, you know, four hours after the thing finished going, oh, you think, oh no, I go, oh, okay. And I love that. I think that, I, I think there's a really thriving and really, productive discussion about Shakespeare going on in the US. And yeah. I, you know, I like being part of it. Well, we like having you here, that's for sure. And uh, have every expectation that you're gonna bring more of that good stuff in the workshops that uh, that you'll be presenting in 23. Is there anything that you really want to bring? You, you talk about sort of growing, continuing to grow decades later into the craft. Anything particularly new or fresh that you think you're ready to try out in 23 when you join us in Phoenix again? Cause I'm, you know, just to anticipate what's coming. I'd like to look, I spend a lot of my time talking about verse and, and language. And I think we don't spend enough time looking at Shakespeare's stagecraft. Mm -hmm. And I would very much like to look at that. Um, I don't, the, 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 panel you talked about uh, at the end of the symposium I, I talked about the the mopping up operation at the end yep. of Romeo and Juliet yep. and I just am fascinated by how precisely he stages something mm -hmm. so that if you put it on a bare stage with no lights no scenery it's got to work because if you listen to what's happening on stage it's going to work like that and you know we spent a lot of time talking about how he says it and we don't spend, I think, enough time thinking about how he does it. Mm -hmm. So I'd really like to look at some staging. But I also love looking at anything that's close reading where you go, wow, that scene is different if you do that to that. Mm -hmm. It all makes a difference. You know, the joy of for me is the teachers I was working with were all keen to get up and do it. And it's only by getting up and doing it, you realize how it works. Mm -hmm. You know, That's reading, right. you don't read silence. You don't read, you know, there's so much you don't get. Whereas you get up and do it and you start seeing really how good he is. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to that set of performances, those practices, those opportunities to, to put the bard to the test, as it were, because he can stand the test for sure. And with your guidance, uh, I expect we're going to have some teachers and school leaders really fired up to recover Shakespeare for that next generation. They uh, they could benefit a few uh, a few of them from, from encountering him afresh. So looking forward to having you back, Nick. Can't wait, and really so, looking forward to it. So thankful uh, for your participation and uh, being a part of this work. You've, uh, you've really blessed us. Thanks so well, much. Great Appreciate pleasure, you. and I look forward to seeing you next year. All right. Very much. Take care. Thank you. Registration for the 2023 National Symposium for Classical Education is now open. Join us February 22nd through the 24th in Phoenix, Arizona for three days of unsurpassed scholarship, professional workshops, and networking opportunities. For more information, visit www.greathearts.institute. Working together to renew the tradition.